welcome friends to this uh, monthly get together that we have every month it helps us to remain on track our minds are such that if we don't meet we just forget the importance of the real thing for which we are human beings that is to discover our own self that possibility does not exist in any other life form except in the human form that is why that's the greatest opportunity we have to find ourselves discover our own origin and if necessary go back to it go back to our true form while i was coming up the elevator just now a couple of friends were there i said what should i talk today they said tell some jokes and stories <laughs> and i thought to myself the biggest joke biggest joke that i know of is that we take this life so seriously that's a great joke this life is merely a created experience and to take it seriously is like a joke and we are so serious about this life that everything depends upon what's going to happen here it is just because we do not know that this is a repeat performance that we have been born in different forms so many times and we have a long history of birth and death and this short period we have especially as a human being a short period we are given an opportunity to find something far more relevant far more important than this physical life itself this physical life is created on certain principles because it's a level of experience in consciousness where we are consciously experiencing through our sense perceptions through our mind through our body we are experiencing meetings with people to dealing with objects dealing with places dealing with time dealing with periods of time this is just a created thing and certain rules have been used to create it the rules are very simple the rules are based upon a principle called cause and effect shall i tell you how it was created by the way what i am going to tell you every every one of you can check out within yourself not outside the statement i am going to make is available to all of you you can check out and i'll tell you how to check out the statement i am going to make is that this experience of physical world was created at a level which we call causal level time was first created what was time now and then that is the time so we could separate events if all the events are clubbed together then you can't experience them physically you can experience them another way but physically you can only experience if they separated therefore time was created and on the timeline which is infinite you were placed you were asked to be placed at one point which was called the present once you entered the present it automatically created a past and also future the funny thing was that only the past and future could be experienced not the present because the present is what is called now now in the physical world we call that present moment now how much time is there in now have you ever considered when i say now it's past before i said it was future now has zero time have you ever realized that we are living actually in zero time so the placing of the self a conscious self that could experience things on the timeline created an experience of now we said no time at all but we were able to experience now because of a past and a future now i'll tell you the reality of these two also the past according to our understanding today is only experienced if we can remember something supposing we don't remember anything of the past it doesn't exist for us but if we remember something we said oh that happened you just heard me use the word now 
because you remember it, therefore it happened. You came into this hall, you remember it, therefore it happened. Supposing you didn't remember anything, it didn't exist. So therefore, the past was built upon memory, completely. If you don't have a memory, there's no past at all. People get into memory losses. Alzheimer's patients have seen, they have no memory what happened in the past, and there is no existence for them of the past. So that is why they don't even know who they are. So memory alone creates the past, a very important factor. What about future? So present is zero time. By memory, we remember the last few things that happened and we call it present. Now has no time, but we mean by now recent past, recent memory, last few seconds, last few minutes is present for us. And when we want to look at the future, it's another great joke. I'll tell you why it's a joke. If we did not anticipate things, if we did not fear something, if we did not hope for something, there'll be no future at all. These three things are done by your consciousness in what we call the present, which is really past. So the future is all actually in the past. So far as our experience is concerned, on the timeline it is placed in front as future. And then what happens? Our consciousness travels on that timeline. That's called time travel. We used to think that only the Egyptians and the pharaohs could do time travel. We are all doing time travel all the time. We can't even stop. Every second that passes, we have moved one second further. Therefore, we are time traveling all the time into a future which is being created by our own activity which has taken place in the past. Therefore, what we call past, present and future is all a function of memory. So what is done at the causal stage when this whole arrangement is being made? At the causal plane, a capsule of memories is picked up and creates our life here. It's like playing a DVD. When you have to play a DVD, DVD is being played outside and you are seeing it outside. Internally, we are playing a DVD which contained a capsule of memories that is being replayed here. And memory doesn't mean that it happens one time because memory is recalling something that happened earlier. Where did it happen? It didn't happen anyway. It was just an arrangement made to have a physical experience. It's made at a level of consciousness, which we call causal level of consciousness. Can we access that level now to see that what I'm saying is true? Yes, not difficult at all. We have made it difficult, but if you understand it's not difficult, it won't be difficult. What we need to do to reach that causal stage and see how timeline is created. And when the time is created, space comes after that. Because to experience an event on time, from now and then we go to here and there. And that is how a three-dimensional experience is created. We are given sense perceptions. We are given a physical body with organs of sense perception attached, which fit in exactly with the model we have set up at the causal stage. I sometimes refer to the two eyes we have. Why do we have two eyes? To create depth or vision of three dimension. So two eyes are seeing two different pictures and we combine them in the head. That is at a central point in the head near the pineal gland. That's where we operate from when we are in a wakeful state and we make it one vision and it becomes three dimensional. If we had one eye, we wouldn't do that. So two eyes have serving a purpose. Why do we have two ears? It gives a sense of direction. Do you realize how space is being created? Only by the use of this simple method. Divide the experience and make different pictures. Where? Where are the pictures being made? Inside us, not outside. There's no outside. Supposing you make a picture. Now I'll give you actual example. 
when we see things outside, how do we see? They say rays of light fall upon the objects and people. That is, that is outside. This is the physical, mechanical definition that they're giving from outside. Rays of light fall outside on things. Objects and people absorb a lot of colors from the seven colors of the, of the spectrum of the rainbow. And the color that is not absorbed is reflected back. So what we are seeing in colors around us is being created by lack of absorption of that color in the objects that are outside. And the, that which is not absorbed is reflected back and flows in near parallel lines to our eyes. And there diffraction takes place first through the lens, then aqueous humor, vitreous humor and uh, inside falls as a upside down picture on the retina. Now that you can see. We can see through uh, microscopic cameras that there is a picture falling on the retina in the body. What is the retina? It's merely an extension of the optic nerve coming from the brain and spread out into the two eyes. The retina has rods and cones. Some pick up the shape, some pick up the color. And that message goes through the optic nerve and goes to the brain. If we are conscious at that time, we see. If we are unconscious, we don't see. Ultimately, consciousness picks up the image we are seeing outside in the brain. Here's the proposition. Supposing we have all been gifted with retinas that make pictures. Not sees pictures, but make pictures. The same picture that we are seeing, we'll see exactly the same world we are seeing now. Some people hallucinate. They see things we can't see. And we say something is wrong with them. Maybe wrong, but how do they see? Hallucination is an actual experience of seeing something which is not there for us. They are in a minority. Supposing the majority is also hallucinating, then we all of us are covered in that. If the retina can do that, the world will look exactly what we are looking at now. No difference at all. The two retinas will combine the picture and in the third eye center, the central pineal gland, we'll see the world as it is now. Supposing it is not a function of retina at all. Supposing it is a function of this optic nerve, at the beginning origin of the optic nerve in the brain, we still see the world the same. Supposing it is not even the optic nerve. Supposing it is consciousness that eventually picks up this image, it will still see the world exactly like it is. What is the truth? Does a world exist outside that we are seeing it? Or are we seeing a world that is inside and looks like it's outside? Those who believe that the world outside must exist before we can see it, they are called materialists. They believe in the reality of material, of matter. And those who think that we can generate an experience inside us from consciousness and have the ability to see outside are called idealists. And the idealist and the materialist have been debating this for a thousand years right now in different countries, different philosophies. They have been debated. They have not checked out. They did not even know that there is an method, easy method of checking out, which is the truth. The method to check out is, can you go to that part of consciousness which is beyond the physical body, beyond the physical eyes, beyond the retina, beyond the brain, beyond sense perceptions, and discover if consciousness is operating to do that. Yes, it can be done. You can go to the level of the causal plane of consciousness by simply becoming unaware of your physical body becoming unaware of your sense perceptions and only see what the mind can do. 
you have to first become unaware of these. Otherwise, we are covered by these almost like blinders. To do that, we use a, a method called correct form of meditation. The correct form of meditation is that which draws you within your own self. If meditation is meditating on things outside, it is not a correct meditation for discovering the cause. If you want to discover the cause, then you have to do correct meditation which takes you inside your own self. No mirrors. Only in your own self. What self? The self that you believe you are the self. Not the body. Not the sense organs. Not even your thoughts. But the one who thinks. The one who sees. The one who uses the body. That self. That self is obviously consciousness. The fact that it can be conscious of something. Whatever the source is, we can discover the secret of consciousness by becoming unaware of the physical body, unaware of the sense perceptions, and unaware of our thoughts, we'll get all the answers to all our questions we've ever asked about creation, about our life, about how life is made, are they past lives or not, how memories are created, how the memories are implanted, how they are implanted in order to create these experiences. All the answers are right there inside us, not outside. I am taking the position that if you do this exercise, you will discover that this world is being created from within yourself. The rest is for you to check it out. Now I'll give you a simple method of doing it. When we are in this physical world, our attention is on physical objects and physical people. We are constantly dealing with them. We wake up and deal with the outside world. We have our breakfast, lunch, dinner, we eat, we run, we view the body, we do other things. And we grow old, the body grows, <coughs> we live a life all outside and then we die. And then we have no idea what happens after death. We have no idea what happened before birth. It's just a compact experience of a body and sense perceptions and the mind thinking inside. And we as consciousness be aware of all this. That's what it is. We do not do correct meditation, which is to go within your own self, not meditate, meditate upon something. <coughs> Withdraw yourself to yourself, whatever you think is yourself, but not the body, not the senses, not the mind. Whatever you think you are besides these, go to that. Obviously, it's not outside anywhere. If you were to make a short survey of your own self. Where am I operating from as a human being? You find it's within the head of the physical body. Not only the head of the physical body, which is of course a small space now, at least we have been able to limit the investigation to a small <coughs> space, few inches, just around the eyes and, and the head. And maybe we should explore the rest of the body also. Maybe we are lying somewhere else, maybe we are in the heart or maybe in other energy centers in the body. You can examine, you see that when you examine in the wakeful state, you will examine, there is my heart below me. Why do you say that? Why are you making the eyes the center of a place where you are saying, where, are, where is your heart below me? Where is your liver below me? How can it be below you if you are there? Obviously, our consciousness operates from the level of the eyes where we say we are, if we are not the body. Which is a very significant thing. Because what is below us cannot be us. What is below us is something, but it's not us. Okay, let us examine what it is. We go down to with our attention. See, what's happening in the heart? Heart is beating. When? When I am emotionally stirred by something. Emotions affect me. There, I know emotions live here. Can I go further down my bellies and all? 
I am hungry. I know where it is. So we know the functions. I have to go for number one and number two. I know it's coming from below. All these things that are happening to us, consisting of our energetic experiences in life, are all happening below. Except we are seeing from here and looking at all these things from here, including inside. We can close our eyes and say, where is my heart? And we'll still say, from here. That is why in the wakeful state, as conscious beings, we are operating from behind the eyes. So it is well said that since the two eyes, but they merge the picture into one in the center of the head, that we call it the third eye. Third eye center is nothing but where we are operating from all the time, wakeful state. Some people tell me, can we find third eye? I say, you are there. You can't be anywhere else. What are you looking for? A person is looking for where he is. How can you find it? People want to travel to where they are. Can they travel? That's what we are trying to do. So many people are thinking it's a spiritual path to travel, have a journey, spiritual journey to go where? Where they are. Here and now is the only reality of where you are. You are here and you are now. That's where you are all the time, 24-7, for all years. You never change your location. It's always here and now. Somebody has sent me a nice song sung by a Pakistani singer, a girl, beautiful voice. It was called, It Nahi, It Nahi, Me. If you are not here, you are nowhere. It's a very simple statement that we are where we are. The rest is being created around us. We never look, change our location. We change the scenes around us. We have never moved as a self. All the experiences have moved around us. And we don't know that. We think we are traveling because we associate ourselves with the body, with the senses, with the thoughts. So that is why the first step is to discover this causal nature of our own self is to become unaware of the body. When we die, we become aware of the inside because the body is no longer there. If we are the body is the reality, then we die with the death. Everything dies. But everything doesn't die. Body dies. Can we find out? Some people say, well, I'm not sure. If we live after life, is there an afterlife? I said, why don't you become sure right now? No, I'll, I'll, be, I'll find out when I die. I said, sorry, you won't be able to come and tell me. But if you do what I am telling you now, you can tell me now if you'll be alive after dying or not. How is that possible? That's po possible by dying while living. Pretend to die. Can you imagine the great Raman Maharishi was led to the spiritual path by a simple experience that he was dying and he said, what is death? What will happen? And he pretended to die and found he was stronger in his, in his will, in his consciousness. And he said, this is not death. That led to his whole discovery. So that is why the, how do we know a body is alive and a world is created around us? If you examine this simple situation, it's all because of our attention. Conscious attention, wherever you place it, becomes a creation. We have put our conscious attention on the body, it becomes real for us. We have used the equipment in the body, we have used the internal systems of sense perception, we have used our thinking and created other realities. It's all being created by attention. If you don't pay attention to something, it doesn't exist for you. Where somebody has no idea what is happening, we discover it tomorrow. When we didn't know it, it wasn't there for us. There are thousands of things happening around us which we are not aware of because our attention is not on that. Our attention span is very small. So that is why only that is coming into our awareness which is where we are putting our attention. Supposing we put our attention on our own self, not on the body, on our own self, as we know where it is, in the head, third eye center, in the center of the head. Supposing we were to close our eyes and say, I am sitting in the center of the head and my body is just a body around me, I am not it. 
very simple experiment. You close your eyes and say, I am sitting in the center of the head. What is my form? Check up. If you can't see your face, take a mirror. Not an outside mirror, inside. Do you know you can make anything inside by imagination, including a mirror? And you'll be surprised to see a different face in that mirror. Try it out. Just imagine you are sitting inside your head, a third eye center, and you want to know who am I, what am I like? Do you have arms and legs? Yeah, you have everything. Do you have eyes to see? Of course you are seeing. You can, every imaginary thing we are seeing with our eyes closed, we are seeing with our imagination, with our inner self. Imagination is a great function of the inner self, not of the outer self. Imagination is an entire function of our inner self. If you imagine that you are behind the eyes and you are looking, you can look, where am I actually? There's just darkness around and then you suddenly see light. You can see colors, you can see people. When you close your eyes completely in darkness and you imagine a person, you can see the person. It does not need light from outside to fall on the person to see which is required here, not inside. Inside you can see anybody. Experiment with this. Supposing you were going involved in this experimenting of what am I inside? What will happen? Gradually, your attention will get so much into that, you'll forget where your hands and feet are outside in the physical body. You'll forget where the rest of the body is. The more you spend time there, the less awareness you will have of outside. Ultimately, you'll be completely absorbed in the awareness of your inner self in your physical body. It's exactly equal to dying physically. It's called dying while living. It can be done by anybody. We have the capacity to do it. We are born with the capacity to do this thing. We don't do it because we take this physical world seriously and real. If you take it as a game, as a projection, as a movie, as something drama set up for us, your whole life, your attitude will change, everything will change in this life. So it's just because we are taking it too seriously. It's a big joke to take it seriously. When it's not serious at all, when it's not just a made up thing to go through a certain experience. We need different experiences because consciousness has to be conscious of something. And we continuously, continuously without break, consciousness creates experiences to be conscious of. Otherwise consciousness itself will disappear if it's not conscious of anything. So that is why there are certain levels at which it operates. This is a physical level. I am just introducing to a different level. Call it imaginary level. Call it astral level. Call it sensory perception level. Because at that level, all your sense perceptions are completely intact. You can see, touch, taste, smell exactly, in fact, better than you can in physical body. So that is why that inner body has all sense perceptions. Actually, sense perceptions itself make the inner body. Even imagination is a function of sense perception. That you will find out inside. That's just one step. Take one more step. With the inner body, meditate. Where? In the head of the inner body. Head is still intact. You will never lose your head. When you meditate and go within, you will have a body which can vary by your imagination. Head will never go. You will always be in a head, in the astral plane, in the sensory system. So you meditate at that level after you have forgotten where this body is. You can't do it both together. You have to do first loss of awareness of this body by concentrating your attention inside and then meditate in the head of the other body, what will happen? You will find that you are not the sense perception, it was just like a body. You will find you are still conscious, and you are still thinking. The main situation will come, you will find I am thinking about everything, and by thinking I can know everything, I don't need to see or touch or taste at all. The thoughts cover everything. When you find that you are a conscious being, with thoughts alone you can do everything. Stay 
your attention at that point, you will discover the very cause which is leading to all the experiences. What I said in the beginning, everything is being made up from there. Timeline is being made up from there. Spend time there and see how timeline and events are created and how events are placed under a law, a principle called cause and effect. Each event placed on the timeline is designated cause, next is event. Event becomes cause, becomes event. And it's all connected so that we can have a smooth experience in our time travel, which we call life. In our time travel from birth to death, whatever time we travel is being created from there. You can see everything. And what I have said today, you'll be able to prove to yourself. This does not mean that you have discovered yourself. It only means that you have found out how this experience is created outside, which is a big thing. Even the first part that this physical world is being generated from something inside. And we don't look inside, we look outside. Therefore, we take it all real. That is why some bad things happen and good things happen. We like the good things, we don't like the bad things. We don't want any bad things, all good things. But the principle by which we take a form, a physical form, requires that we take bad things. Again, the same principle of cause and effect. The principle is, if you do good things, only good things in life, and have good things in life, you will not come back here again. You will go to heaven. And where is heaven? Has anybody ever seen heaven? Some people say we can make a heaven here. Yes, you can. If you discover a heaven inside, this will also be heaven, I'll tell you. But the heaven is inside. At the sensory plane, at the astral plane. You can visit it. See how people are enjoying themselves based upon all good things. They did a lot of good things. They lived a good life. And they got heaven. Oh, and there are some people who did all bad things. And there is also a hell in the same level. When we create heaven and hell here, we are picking it up from the imaginative state of heaven and hell that exists there. So that is why everything here is a copy of something that is there. Some Greek philosophers, Socrates and Plato, were talking about the world of ideas being more real. Some French philosophers recently were examining this and I remember one team of French philosophers who were working on this whole principle of how ideas come into being and how ideas can be made into physical things, interviewed me in India many years ago. And they wanted to know where does concept come from? Where does an idea come from? Where does physical reality come from? I said, very good words you are using and I can tell you exactly where they come from. The concept comes from the causal plane of the mind. Ideas come from the sensory planes and the physical things we make from the ideas and the concepts in the physical world. It's all divided in three levels. And these three levels of consciousness are accessible to us through correct meditation. That is why I always say, here is something that is verifiable. Validate it by your own experience. So why do we debate so much? We sit outside and keep on arguing, keep on debating. Why not go in and check it out? By going in, you can check out every statement I'm making. That is why it's good to know that these experiences, all experiences of all possible kind of all time and space are covered by three levels of consciousness. The physical level in which we are sitting now. The astral level, we call it astral level because there's a new sky there. An astral, which does not have a darkness. An astral level where sense perceptions exist. A causal level where the mind exists. The mind, senses, body, three levels. And these three levels are creating all our experiences. No experience exists beyond that except the self that is having the experiences. So we still don't know the self. We can know our mind. We can know our self perception. We can know these different kinds of bodies we have. But we don't know the self still. And there is no way we can know the self while we are sitting in these three. So that's very strange that we can have access to 
the highest level from where all creation takes place. All creation which can be defined as creation by us is taking place these three levels of consciousness. Yet the self is only experiencing all these but is none of these two. To find the self is something beyond that point. And there no amount of struggle, no amount of meditation, no amount of correct meditation can ever take you to a realization of the self. Because all these are functions of the mind. The mind is creating everything. You can discover the mind by mind's own effort. But you can't discover something that is completely beyond the mind. Beyond these three levels. So that is why that's where we have so many people with correct meditation are stuck. They can't go anywhere. Then suddenly somebody says, I am not interested in these three things so much. I am more interested in who is having these experiences. The real self that is having experience of the mind. The real self having experiences of sense perceptions. The real self having experiences of the physical world and physical experiences. Where is that real self? What is the real self? Some people who distinguish the real self from the mind have given it a name, call it the soul, the soul, the spirit. But when they talk of the soul, I have conversations with them. I say, what does the soul say? Soul thinks like this. Soul doesn't think. Soul uses mind to think. What does soul do? If you have de designed a particular word, you have created a word, soul, spirit, true spirit, you're calling them by these names, and most of the time people are talking of their astral self, sensory self and calling them soul. I noticed that. And very large majority of people are calling their mind their soul. How can that be so that mind, when the self is using the mind, self has to be a separate entity? Yes, it is. Self is not the mind. Self is not the sense perception. Self is not the body, physical body. It is the user, the creator and user of all these three. I can, I can design another word for it. It's just language. I can say it's consciousness. Consciousness creates the mind. Consciousness creates... These, these sense perceptions, consciousness creates physical experiences, consciousness creates this whole universe. Correct? But in other words, what is consciousness? Where does it come from? Where does it reside? Where can I find it? There is no answer. Because all the answers we are trying to find are through our mind. We don't have any other faculty at this time at all. Now, no faculty is available to us to find the self. And dear people claim that they have found their self when they just find one step further that we have seen a heaven, therefore we found ourselves. Just another form. But does not mean the self cannot be realized. It is realized by people who are searching for that self. Most of us are not. I get hundreds of emails every day from my friends. And they ask me questions. And they ask me help in some ways and most of them are asking help in the physical plane. We have a problem here, we have a financial problem, we have a domestic problem, we have a money problem, we have a sickness problem, we have a health problem, please help us. All connected with the physical body. Very few are asking about the inner plane and about the soul, extremely rare. Anybody is wanting to find what is beyond the mind. But those who are seeking something the beyond the mind to their true self, which are few, for them appear perfect living masters. Perfect living masters. Three words. Why are they perfect? Nobody is perfect. We have all imperfections. All human beings have some imperfections. And we all know our imperfection, that we know that we are trying to be perfect, but we are really imperfect. How are these people perfect? They are ordinary human beings like us. They appear like ordinary human beings because we like to talk to ordinary human beings. 
if some invisible angels are around, we, they can't help us much. We can't even ask questions and not be sure if they really are there or not. But an ordinary human being in a physical form is something we can see with our physical eyes, talk with physical tongues and have a conversation and learn something. So naturally these perfect living masters appear in physical form. The perfection in them consists of the fact that they are aware in consciousness of what is beyond the mind. Not that they meditated and found it. Nobody found by meditation, by the way. They found it by another method which they then used to give to the others also that knowledge. All imperfection ends at the mind. All division into perfect and imperfect is done by the mind. There is no imperfection above the mind. And they are living in a state of being, state of consciousness 24-7. In that state which is beyond the mind. Therefore, they are conscious of that which is beyond the mind. And therefore, they are beyond imperfection and are perfect. We call them perfect masters. Why are they living masters? Living means physically living. Physically living? Because supposing they are not physically living. And some people tell me, we have faith in a dead master. We have faith in some master who came earlier. I said, how does the master communicate with you? Inside my head. I said, can you really examine who's communicating with you? If you are willing to give me the time, I'll be able to prove to you, everyone who has said I'm talking to a master who's not alive is talking to his own mind. It is not possible. All our function of awareness of conversations going on with anybody are being created by your own mind. That is why it is completely unreal to say that a person who is not alive is guiding you. People are telling me in the Himalayas, ascended masters are sending us messages. They have never met those ascended masters. I happen to have met those masters. I worked in the Himalayas. Part of my job for years I was there. Met those people. They have no contact with those people. That they are talking about that we are getting ascended masters. It's all mind. Mind is making up all the conversations. Mind is making up all the stories. And the stories are all built on three dimensional basis of sense perception and physical activity. That's not, a that's not a connection with any master. A perfect living master is a living person like us who is living here now. And when our mind says I am getting that message, he can tell us no, it's not your message. It's your mind. If he is not there, our mind will say I am the master. The mind can take any form and takes the form of the master. Any master you can invent. You can't invent a living being in the physical body, we cannot invent another living body to guide us. That is why they are living, perfect living masters. Why are they masters? Why are they perfect living masters? Because part of their destiny is to share this information and share this awareness and make people aware of that. Aware of what? Aware of what is beyond the mind. So that is why perfect living masters are very rare. Very rare in this planet. Because the seekers for that kind of truth are very rare. But wherever the seekers are, perfect living masters appear automatically. We don't know who they are. We can't even find them. They are ordinary human beings. We can never know who is a perfect living master. We don't have the equipment to know that. So we can't find them. If they were extraordinary, then we could probably find them. Supposing we find, while I am talking to you, a master flies into this hall. He's extraordinary because he can fly with his body. We can't fly. I can't fly. You can't fly. But he's flying in. So we look at him. He must be a real master because he has managed the art of levitation and is flying here. When he flies around in this hall, we look up and say, I know majority will say there is a trick. I will also say that. I will also try to see if there is a little 
string somewhere, small string that is carrying him or, or something else. Supposing I find that is not a string or something, but he has practiced some kind of yoga, which levitation can, can be possible. He might have done that. I can admire that person. We'll all be impressed by that feat. One thing we cannot do. We cannot love that person. We can admire him. We can worship him. We can adore him. We can be impressed by him. We cannot love him. Supposing while he's performing that, he falls down. For the first time, compassion and love will come in our heart. Can I help you? I am bringing in a subject that's the most important subject when we are dealing with perfect living masters. The subject is called love. Love is not created by the mind. Love is not created by the sense perceptions. Love is not created by the body. Love is created by the soul. So soul has a function of its own. And it's happening right here. Love is a very strange experience. Love is an experience where you are drawn by something which you can't explain. It does not happen in time like a thought does. When we think of something, it takes time. When love comes, no time. It's always spontaneous, sudden. Therefore, love does not follow the law of time and space. It does not follow the law of the mind. It does not follow causal law. Love is a very unique thing. But when we use the word love because we are attracted to something, we forget that there is a big distinction between love and attachment. All attachments we are calling love. Attachments are not love. When we fall in love with somebody, somebody draws us. Our thought is in the beloved. Our mind is occupied by thinking about that beloved horse who has attracted us with that love. We are not thinking too much about ourselves. If love is strong, we will not even think of ourselves at all, only of the beloved. In attachment, we think of ourselves first. When somebody says, I love you, you say, but I hate you, he says that I also hate you. I is stronger when a person is constantly saying, I love you, I love you. The ego is very strong. In true love, you forget about yourself. It's a very big distinction between attachment and love. These perfect living masters come here operating from the level of love. And all we really experience with them is love. They pull us with their love. Mind doesn't accept it. Mind says, what is happening to you? Are you getting crazy? There's nothing in it. It's just an ordinary person. And the mind argues against the experience we are having. But if we are seekers of the soul, the power of that love, which is touching soul to soul from a master, overpower the mind. It may take time. It may take distance. It may take something. But it will definitely be the love of a perfect living master pulls the soul, disciple of the soul, to his own realization and to go beyond the mind to a true home. That is why the pathway beyond the mind is based on something else. It's not based on effort at all because you can't make effort and fall in love with anybody. You can destroy love by making effort and a lot of people have done that. But you cannot create it. So that is why these perfect living masters are ordinary human beings. Very ordinary. Sometimes more ordinary than most of us. These ordinary people appear in our life when we are ready to go beyond our mind and want us seeking inside for our true home where we belong. They are coming in response to that. We don't know them. They know us. They know there's a seeker here for whom we have come. They appear in the physical world as physical human beings with the single mandate. Here is a soul tired of being in the experimental stage of the mind, senses and body. A 
and wants to go back home, to home, where he belonged, from where the whole show started. They want to go back to the true home and they come to take that soul back to the true home. Only job. They have not come to teach anything. They have not come to reform the world. They have not come to tell us good things. They have not come to tell anything to take the soul back to the true home. In the process of taking us back to the true home, they have to deal with our body, our mind, our sense perceptions, our mind has a great training in creating doubts and fears. It is a good training. The mind was trained to practice these. At the very moment it was created, the mind was trained to eliminate a people just following whatever is in front of them, but to screen it. Don't just believe everybody what he says, screen it. The mind was given skepticism, <laughs> doubt was given, created inside mind, doubt everything to start with, till the doubt is cleared. It's a good screening method. So it's a good method. So the mind certainly then does the job and applies doubt. How can I be sure what this guy is saying? How can I be sure he is anybody? How can I? So the mind creates doubt. And every doubt leads to fear. I am afraid I may get trapped somewhere. The doubt creates fear. And doubt is automatic in a mind. So imagine we are all living in a state of doubt and fear most of our life. What would happen if you were above the mind? Can you imagine if you have a single experience of finding that the mind is merely a cover and you are the self? From that moment, you'll never have any doubt and never have any fear. There's a possibility for human beings to become completely doubt-free and completely fear-free, completely fearless, merely by a correct method, meditation, after you have found a perfect living master who pulls you with his thumb. It's very simple. There are other things also that happen with the soul. Love is the most fundamental thing that the soul functions with. It functions here, functions all the time, functions everywhere. Functions right in our true home, right up to here. Love functions. The second part is knowing something suddenly, without thought. We call it intuition. Intuitive awareness comes from the soul, not from the mind. Because it does not involve time. Mind functions by thinking. And thinking takes time. Even the smallest thought takes time. Nobody can think anything without involving time. Love, intuition does not take time. It's beyond time. That's the third part. Appreciation of beauty. Feeling of peaceful state. There are a number of things that can happen. They happen only in the soul. Anything that happens giving you something that can't be called an experience even, but it happens in your awareness that is not connected with time is a soul, spiritual experience. Love is a spiritual experience. True love is always a spiritual experience. True intuition is always a spiritual experience. True beauty is true and knowing beauty, experiencing beauty, spiritual experience. Feeling a blissful state suddenly, spiritual experience. They are all happening to our soul, to our self, but beyond the mind. Now, for those seekers who want to go to their true home beyond the mind, a perfect living master will appear automatically in their life. How will you, how will you know where we are? How can he appear anywhere? Well, when we understand and go up to the mental level and find the whole thing is being created from inside, he also appears from inside, not from outside. That means for a seeker who wants to go to our true home, the perfect living master is sitting inside the seeker from the time of the seeking itself and appears from inside like everything else appears from inside. 
So that is why it is not that he is really an outside person, he is really an inside one, appearing like others in the course of your life. So the truth is, this thing can also be verified by putting your attention inside. You will find at every level, if you have seen him outside, if you have met him outside, if you have been accepted by him, that he is taking you to your true home outside, you will see him inside at every level of consciousness, right to the end. So it's a strange, strange method, method set up for us to discover not only our own self, but discover even our true home. What's the distinction between discovering ourselves and discovering our true home? When we discover ourselves with soul, we are unit of consciousness and many souls. When we go to true home, we find it's one soul which is which can act as many souls. And the many are in the one. That's the only difference between our true home and finding who we are. This is a People call it a spiritual journey. There is no journey. What I'm talking of is right here. Right in our head. Right in our consciousness. It's just covered up. Our self, our true home. We have never left it. The whole show is taking place in our true home. We are not going anywhere to discover our true home. We are just removing the obstacles around us. We are just removing the blinders away and seeing what is inside. These three are big blinders. The physical body making us feel we are a physical being only. <laughs> and consciousness is just a function of the brain. A very big mistake. But we can resolve it by experimenting, by going within. And we find we can be unaware of the body and we find the other inner body of sense perceptions. We can leave that also. Mind is also a body. A causal body that thinks. We to move it off. We don't have need to think. We know everything without thinking. Total knowledge is right there. Then, no time, space, total knowledge, that's what we are as individual souls. But we are conscious beings, alive, more alive than now. And then we can go to true home and discover the whole truth of everything. This whole creation is taking place in the true home, not outside anywhere. There is no outside. Everything is inside. Remember the word, inside. Go within yourself, within more self, more further. When you go, Further and further inside, you discover your true home. And if you are lucky, you will be seeking your true home. The perfect living master will, by coincidence, appear in your life at the right time when you are ready. He is ready, he will appear. And he will accept you. Let's go. That's all his job. He's, he will teach for the sake of your mind. He will become like a teacher. Just because the mind wants to be taught. He doesn't, you don't need that teaching and he doesn't need to teach. But the mind doesn't believe it. Therefore, for the sake of the mind, all these teachings come. I have shared these secrets with you. But they are no secrets. You go within, you will find each one of you has the capacity to find all of this. It is not based upon book knowledge. Books don't give us. Books make us read even more. And we like them, like stories. They're nice stories that some people had. Please do not go by somebody else's experience. Go with your own experience. We'll have a short break and I'll come back about 3.30. I'll come back and talk to you for half an hour. And then I'll meet people, especially those who have never met me before, from 4 o'clock onwards. And if we have time, I'll meet some others who have met me before. And Connie has a list, Connie Rees. And if you are new here, you can give your name to Connie if you want to have a few minutes personal time with me. That will be up to 4 o'clock. Thank you very much. I'll see you in the afternoon. Enjoy some snacks.